The following content is meant purely for educational and informational purposes and should not be relied upon as financial, investment, legal, tax, or any other professional advice. This is the Fundamentals Podcast, where we demystify crypto and help you navigate this ever-evolving internet native economy. In this episode, we're joined by Benjamin, the founder and CEO of Multiverse X, a layer one blockchain designed from scratch to bring a 1000x cumulative improvement in throughput and execution speed. To achieve this, Multiverse X introduces two key innovations, a novel adaptive state sharding mechanism and a secure proof of stake algorithm, enabling linear scalability with a fast, efficient, and secure consensus mechanism. Over the next hour, we discuss how Multiverse Multiverse X works and what sets it apart from other blockchains on the market. We speak about the innovations behind achieving high transaction throughput, ensuring safety via an on-chain two-factor authentication mechanism, the effects of having tokens embedded into the protocol, and how the X portal, wallet, and super app fit into the grand vision for Multiverse X. We then break down Multiverse X's current app, developer, and user landscapes, and speak about the upcoming X Day conference and hackathon, and how they aim to bridge the gap between builders and decision makers. Finally, we speak about Multiverse X's economic model, the eGold token, what the best metrics are to track the adoption of a blockchain network, and what economic sustainability means. Tune in for a great discussion about Multiverse X and tackling the problems that are critical to solve for mass adoption. Hello, Benjamin. Welcome to the Fundamentals Podcast. It is great to have you on. Hello there. It's really great to be here and a pleasure to have this conversation. I'm excited for this. Now, as the blockchain market sector has kind of seen a lot of new entrants over the years, and there's a lot going on there in terms of technical innovation, I'd love if you can start the session off with what Multiverse X's core value proposition is. Sure. So the entire point of Multiverse X is to essentially build one blockchain that can scale to the point of the internet so that you make this transition from dial-up to broadband as the internet did. And so we're specifically focused on two points, making sure that scalability is done in a way that you never have to worry about it. And then security is done in a way where you don't have people losing money every day because of bugs, because of some decisions on the architecture and and so forth. So we have two points that we've been discussing a lot about recently. One, the entire point that we've done related to scalability is based on adaptive state sharding. So we're the first and perhaps the only network that has solved this in practice and has implemented this. And so this enables us to scale with demand and make sure that as we need more demand for the network, more processing power, we can already do this. And in addition to this, we've also thought about some very important aspects that are built on top of the architecture. Two examples that come to mind are a different type of token system that is built in, that is very different from the um, smart contract type of token that you see in Ethereum or in other architectures, which does two things. One, the token is sort of built into the protocol, which means it scales incomparably better than any type of smart contract type token. And then second, it solves some crucial security issues such that you never have to worry about attacks where someone sends you a token and drains your wallet. Then this type of solution is so crucial the more you scale down the road. That's one aspect. And the second aspect that is even more crucial almost on, on the security side is something that we've just released two months ago, which is on-chain 2FA, a service that essentially removes 99% of the issues that users have at this point, just because it reproduces something that exists in Web2 in a way that is decentralized and built on top of the chain. So we're quite excited about the security part with each passing day, with each new hack that we see, it almost validates that not only is scalability necessary, but then beyond having scalability, if you have security, security is the one thing you need in order to survive as you want to scale. Completely agree with you there. And you touched on a lot of very interesting topics that I want to dive deeper into today. But is it fair to say that the main optimizations that you have focused on compared to previously launched blockchains are in fact scalability and security and the combination of those two? Yeah, so we essentially have built the first 
blockchain architecture that had adaptive state sharding, a combination of adaptive state sharding and secure proof of stake. So the idea of sharding is very well known in, let's say, technical discussions, but applying it to the blockchain is something that at first seemed more like an ambition or, or a dream that um, was nearly crazy than something that could be applied. Um, of course, it took many, many years and a lot of um, very focused effort. But this idea of having this live has entirely changed the space. And then second, of course, having a version of secure proof of stake combined with that in a way where sustainability is built in at the core such that the network can run as effective as possible. The network reconfigures itself as the demand grows in order to scale and, and all of that. So it's effective at every point in time such that it um, not only wastes or uses as little or minimal resources as possible or just as much as it requires, but then it can scale and do so in a way that um, still remains um, at this point fully carbon negative and has a very deep focus on this part as well, in addition to solving the um, scalability and the security part. Got it. And focusing on scalability first, before we uh, move on to speak more about safety, if we look at your current performance metrics, you boast pretty impressive TPS rates of about 30,000 at the moment, if I've understood it correctly, and the potential to scale to over 100,000 transactions per second. Now, this is pretty much related to the technical breakthrough of sharding that you mentioned there, where you've been able to implement all three aspects of sharding at the same time, as that's been a pretty tough problem to crack in the space and a hot topic at the moment as well. Could you dive a bit deeper into how you've successfully implemented state network and transactions all at once? Indeed, this was a very, very fundamental breakthrough that we've had. And what now seems almost like a natural conversation at that point uh, seemed very much like a crazy idea that no one believed could be done. So it was a very gradual process in the sense that We've had some conversations at the end of 2017, had a breakthrough at that point, had a very clear idea about the architecture, how it could be done, how it could work. Then in early 2018, something like May 2018, we've um, published the first white paper that formalized the first state charted architecture in the space, solving or, or addressing all the challenges. And then we move forward to demonstrating this in practice and validating the hypothesis that this could effectively be built because it one th it's one thing to formalize an architecture, detail it, and then you can still die in 1,000 ways on the path of bringing this to, to reality. So we've built the prototype and it was extremely difficult to, to solve this part. In fact, the prototype then was this major stepping stone. But then from the prototype to the first version of the testnet, we achieved a 30x improvement in performance just because of how much the prototype had to uh, sort of solve different things that we needed to clarify in practice, different elements around the technology, the implementation. We used some technology to write the prototype and then rewrote everything from scratch in a completely different language. And so at network release, we achieved not only this part, so solving network transaction and state charting, but then we also made another we, we had that 30x improvement from prototype to the first release. Then in the meantime, we achieved another 2x in terms of shard performance. And by end of this year, we'll probably have another 2x in terms of shard performance. So there's been a very significant continuous improvement process in the architecture and what we had to deliver. But the one thing that we've built from the start, and we intentionally did so, was to gather a team with which we can literally build rockets. And then this type of problems becomes the type of challenges that you want to undertake, that you really want to push towards. And so, yeah, it, it was extremely difficult, took years of effort, 
but to see how this panned out and to now have this discussion where the network is live can process all of this and we have this type of conversation is an extraordinary moment for multiverse x yeah that, that's fascinating and given the tough problems that you are working on cracking and then also the grandiose vision that you laid out in the beginning of replacing pretty much the entire internet with a blockchain could you speak a bit about your view on the current state of the blockchain landscape especially from the perspective of your position within it so if we think about a fully crypto native future as there are several different projects where does multiverse x fit in sure I would um, clarify one point. I don't believe that the entire internet will be replaced by a blockchain. Um, in fact, I think um, the elements are very complementary in the sense that in some sense, you essentially have computation and computation just becomes more advanced, high performance and enables you to do much more things. Now, the internet is just a much smarter, effective and high performance network of this type of computation. And so what I believe blockchain will do for the internet is play the role of a kind of truth machine, not only for the internet, but for the world. As you have the, the uh, internet, you, you can think about it as a, this type of nervous system for humanity, where um, almost in real time, you start to learn, understand, see everything that is happening at any other point in history or any other space in the world. As soon as you can see this, you of course need to be able to process all of this. And so with what we currently have in the AI space, things will become increasingly difficult to the point that where through your sensory input, you'll not be able to differentiate what's real, what's not. We essentially have crossed that point where you can easily say that the person that you're discussing with is not a robot. At this point, from image to video to text, all of that uh, points to this tipping point that is happening in front of our eyes and increases this idea of having two types of computation. Computation that is extraordinarily effective at processing data within databases, which is ch chat GPT-like technology, just artificial intelligence applied such that you have interpolation, extrapolation, and then new breakthroughs given all the knowledge you have. And then at the same time, you need a different type of computation, a different type of platform where the world needs to move from, let's say, paper guarantees to cryptographic guarantees. It needs to move to a point where you have some immutability, some proofs that some things are done full transparency on what has been done and programmability in order to automate some tasks. And it seems like the interplay between these two worlds will be the most fascinating thing that we'll see during the next period. Of course, this playing both in our world and in the many worlds that were maybe built, whether it's the metaverse or augmented reality, mixed reality and, and so forth. So I believe that coming back, this type of scalability and inexpensiveness and security is fundamental to a layer that you want to embed in the internet that will be able to tell you as you interact with things, this is true, this is not true, this is verified, this is not verified, this has happened, this has not happened. So having this type of layer of transparency, the further you look in the future, it's very clear that it becomes a necessity such that we can leverage everything that we've built with machines and AI and um, all of that. So super excited to actually see this play out with Multiverse X and with the internet and the technology. But I do think it will be the recurring and probably the most fascinating theme that we'll see over the next few years. Yeah, that's great. It gets me excited about the future of everything related to blockchain and the way you pitch that. Now, moving on to the safety aspect, because you have made some great advancements on that front as well. And it has been a very big issue in all of crypto. And I'd say a big blocker for mass adoption, because those are the first things that, you know, the media narrative tags onto is issues related to security. So starting with number one, the two-factor authentication that you mentioned at the beginning, you've introduced the first on-chain version of 
two-factor authentication. How does this work? And then how does it enhance security from a user's perspective? Yeah, so for everyone that is in the blockchain space and maybe for people that are playing or touching crypto and blockchains for the first time, security is probably the most, let's say, painful experience that they discover. It's either that someone steals their money, so they just bought something, they're excited, they're happy, and then someone on Telegram or someone random gives them this link that they should validate the wallet, do something else, and, and so forth, to the point where it's now clear that billions of dollars have been stolen like this. And so we've thought about many aspects that could improve security, but I don't believe there's anything that comes close to this idea of reapplying to FA. The same idea that you have outside of crypto, outside the blockchain, through Google Authenticator or something like that. This type of protocol built in on top of the blockchain such that it's part of the protocol and is enabled through any type of service that you have that integrates the protocol. This is so fundamental that it immediately um, makes your wallet essentially bulletproof if you have this enabled. Why? Well, because anyone accessing your wallet can now not transfer the fund. They cannot drain your wallet without the second factor authentication. So. While this is so simple, if you think about it, the fact that we did not have something like that, that it has not been widely adopted yet as a standard, speaks a lot about where the blockchain, let's say, space and industry is, and also a lot about some of the things that we've been pushing for that will gradually essentially reposition everything just because in some of the other ecosystems. Unfortunately, a lot of people die, a lot of people lose their money. This has been the case even for Multiverse X, and it's very sad when you see friends or someone close that actually goes through this experience. And so coming back to what the 2FA standard does is it essentially makes you invulnerable to any type of hack where the person should essentially steal not only your wallet and everything, but then also the second factor part, the one that you would receive. And this is one thing that is embedded at the protocol level. But I'll also mention that there is a version that is called Invisible Guardians that is implemented in the exportal wallet that essentially abstracts this complexity of setup, right? Because there's this idea of sovereignty that users love in the blockchain space that where you get the information, you need to set it up, you need to be aware of everything. And then there's also this idea where the user never cares. He wants by default to be secure. Like, don't tell me all the things that I need to do, just make it secure by default. And if I want to opt out, I'll opt out. So it's great to have this live and not discuss about it. This is the first uh, standard that has been released in the space that is live. And we are, of course, extraordinarily excited to have it. That's such an important step in increasing security. Now, when you think of 2FA, the first thing that comes to mind is like, it's a no brainer. You know, every wallet should have had that for ages. Are you able to speak about why it has been so hard to implement within the blockchain space? There are a few problems. So implementing a 2FA normally is not the problem. The problem is, can you implement something at the protocol level? Well, usually the protocol doesn't care about these things. Unless you have a vertical integration of several things, you'll much more discuss about how this scales, how the network does this and that, but you don't necessarily want to embed application level stuff unless you make it another protocol. So this can be seen as a protocol within the core protocol that enables several applications to interact with it, to enable it or disable it, to define certain rules. And I think um, most of the other players are probably much more focused on some of the other things, have not yet either stumbled or, or thought about the, the challenge. And um, many applications would love to have something like that, but if it's not implemented in the protocol, then um, you, you essentially lose the non-custodial nature of the element, right? So if 
you have highest level of security, you have it when your wallet and your keys are yours, no one else has access to them. That's the highest level of security. Now, if you give me a 2FA, then the question is, can you give me a 2FA that does not compromise this, that does not give you access to my wallet or cannot give you power to stop my transactions in any way? So this has been extremely challenging, but it is core and fundamental if we want to see widespread adoption. The more you look at it from this lens outside of the space, just Web2 lens, the clearer it becomes that it's a no-brainer. You want to solve it technically in, a, in the most elegant way possible. And having both highest level of security and just this element of sovereignty, that's, that's not only beautiful, but then also very, very useful for the users. Definitely agree. And on the previous point, you mentioned X portal, and I want to tag on to that because instead of just building a smart contract platform, handling uh, execution and settlement of transactions, you've also decided to work on the user interface side of things by providing the full experience via the X portal super app, which is not just a wallet, but also kind of a decentralized application. So could you speak about the reasoning behind why you wanted to also maintain control over that part? of the stack and not just the blockchain and speak a bit about what the super app does. Sure. The entire point is essentially twofold and goes back to what we were thinking when we were looking at this as a fundamental problem to onboarding billions of users. And the most important thing that we care about is this. Why? Because if you have billions of users, then the entire pr- pie grows tremendously. Everyone is in an incomparably better position to build, to serve, to essentially just deploy other different types of applications that in this market cannot exist yet or do not have a sufficiently large target market. So the insights that we came to were that just as uh, with the early internet days, you needed two important breakthroughs in order to achieve this type of large-scale adoption. One was the transition from dial-up to broadband. Without that, um, you will clearly not see applications as the ones we see on the internet today. Um, This was the key point of adaptive state charting and building an architecture that really scales. But then there was another point that was much more nuanced that I think um, everyone in the space sort of missed, which is still probably, potentially, even more important if you have the scalability part, uh, which is without the browser, the internet would have never existed as it exists today. Why? Because you would most likely have had a network between like universities, the armies, and a few super smart geeks, but not a marketplace for ideas, for inventions, for apps where everyone can surf and browse without knowing anything, just looking around. And so this second point brings us to the idea of having an interface that abstracts away the complexity and rebuilds this entire universe from the user standpoint, just making his life as simple as possible, as exciting as possible, and then sharing the most important breakthroughs that have been built through the lens of the user. Now, coming specifically to what the app enables, um, you can think of it as a kind of bulletproof wallet that sort of no one can touch. It's non-custodial. So whenever you have some money, um, there is no better security than essentially you owning the wallet and then also not having to do rocket science work in order to secure that wallet. So if you can have that type of security and then an onboarding that is progressive, elegant, and simple, then you're already in a different world. You can have a very different type of conversation. So this is in the first place what Xportal brings. I would invite all the users just to take a look at the wallet because this is, uh, and of course I'm super biased here as you can clearly see, but we aimed to build the most intuitive and beautiful application for the user 
that then shares these benefits. And so if you look at the app, the fact that it's non-custodial, of course, you learn something, but then it just works. You don't have to go through many steps in order to access that. The fact that you have the on-chain 2FA, which in Exportal we call the invisible guardian, that enables you to introduce the second factor authentication and to just make everything more secure. That's again, simple and cool and beautiful. The fact that we have, of course, everything related to DeFi, whether it's swaps, whether it's interaction with wallets, it is multi-chain already, supports several chains such that you can interact not only with uh, Multiverse X, but also with Bitcoin and Ethereum. But things move one step further. The idea of having gamification on top of that, such that you can learn new things almost every day, participate in quests, and then explore this new type of world. That's um, extraordinary. But then we move one step further. Even in the current version, we already have a card. The, the best way to actually talk about this uh, application is to just take it out and whenever I show the application to someone and do not discuss that there will be a card in the future that we have this digital layer that you have gamification and so forth, but you have a card with which you can just go and spend this digital money. That's sort of magical already. It changes this experience into something that you can use on a daily basis. Now, beyond that, there's another layer that you alluded to, which is this smart hub which is almost like a dApp store within this app where all the applications that are built on top of Multiverse X can leverage an SDK and have distribution to the users such that all the users, when they want to interact with the apps, they can just tap on app, their identity, wallet, all of that is integrated. They can interact with the app. That's again, extremely secure beautiful, but then also very useful for developers that really want to speak to the users and interact with them. So this we all have live now, but of course X day is coming and much more is coming to this application that I really think will bring a lot of excitement to the users. So super happy about it. And I also think that coming back to the, this opens up a different adoption space, right? It's a different language that speaks something and delivers something for the user. It's why we're extraordinarily excited about it. I think that's great. And the fact that you, from the very early days, your approach to the market is to unlock mass adoption and build products for the masses, which is very different to what I would say we've typically seen in the blockchain space. So uh, I like that. Now, going back to a safety aspect, another thing that is unique to Multiverse X, and you alluded to it a bit earlier on, is the fact that you have tokens embedded directly into the protocol. Could you speak about what that means in practice from the perspective of a user? Yeah, so essentially a user doesn't care. The only benefit that he sees is that it works really fast, like extraordinarily fast, it scales, it's composable, so the user can interact through his token with a lot of applications, and it just works. So from the standpoint of the user, it's super inexpensive, works extraordinarily fast, scales, and then gives him all these benefits with one important point, without the downside of the security challenges that I was mentioning before. So a lot of the benefits exist in, in some other space, but just with the downside that someone can send you a token that drains all your wallet or, or something like that, which I think is, uh, again, crucial. And once solved at the protocol level opens this a very, very different conversation that what you'll see with Multiverse X is almost like you have a Lego set and near this Lego set, you add another Lego, another Lego. Now with each Lego, the, the solution space of what you can build becomes even more fascinating, even more interesting. First, you can build this car, but then you can build this robot, then you can build this spaceship. And um, things become um, even more interesting with each new step that um, we deliver. Got it. Now, given both the technical breakthroughs that you're working on and then improving the user experience throughout the whole ecosystem, you alluded to it earlier, but 
the prerequisite for this is to be able to put together a stellar team. Could you speak about the different teams and the roles that are contributing to the core development of Multiverse X at the moment? There are many, many people around the world that are building on these tools and uh, contribute to them. There are open source tools built uh, within the community by different builders, and um, they're all um, extraordinary, put in a lot of effort. There's also a super passionate community that always engages, comes with feedback, ideas, and, and all of that. And in addition to all this, beyond the different teams that are startups, just building on top of the architecture and um, everything that's being built, there are probably around 250 people at this point, just part of the different products that are part of Multiverse X, whether a product or a component is the protocol, whether there's um, the VM, whether there are tools and, and so forth, whether there are web applications with wallets and, and uh, SDKs and all of that, or Exportal and different other applications. The key point here is that we've taken a very different approach and that at this point, we're essentially scaling everything such that we're always differentiating between the efforts that the foundation is putting very focused into essentially expanding the network, growing it, providing the tools and enabling everyone to, to build on it. And then different efforts that we're doing very intentional in order to accelerate this type of adoption. Because at every point in time, the, the question is not if we'll see adoption, we'll see adoption. And this is sort of the, the one thing that we're um, convinced on. But the question is, can we accelerate it instead of this taking 10 years? Can we make it such that it takes five years, that it takes three years? Is there something we can do to facilitate and enable faster iterations? And this is why we're pushing um, extraordinary hard on, on all fronts to enable something like this. Got that. And, and given your architecture, which apps would you say are best suited to be built on Multiverse X? So... As an idea, there are at this point probably uh, more than 7,000 applications deployed on Multiverse X. And then there are uh, probably around more than 2,500 tokens with their economies and communities and, and all of that. I would say there are a very wide range of applications that are being built, whether it's just gaming payments or different other applications that have to do with real world experiences like Holoride. I'm, I'm not sure if you know about it. This is a kind of metaverse product that essentially brings entertainment and experience in everyday life to your everyday travel, such that if you're in a car, you just put the headset on your eyes and then play a game and then can interact with different elements and all of that. They're actually a spin-off of Audi. So Audis uh, that are bought right now come with a headset that is integrated uh, with Holoride and, and all of that. So there are, I would say, a few things that we're extremely excited about that we'll probably see a lot of immediate adoption in. And there are a few things that are much more exotic, um, and experimental and exploratory that have not existed in the past and that require much more iterations in order to reach a point where there's a clear product market fit, the growth is um, very um, significant and, and so forth. Among the things that we're excited about and we believe we'll see sort of immediate larger scale adoptions with iterations is the payment space. That's very clear uh, blockchain essentially enables a much more streamlined, programmable, and then natively digital uh, payment system that should work just as the internet works. The fact that 30 years after the internet is here, we still don't have a payment system that works in real time, that enables global end-to-end -end payments is very, very surprising, especially given how large the money pot is that sits on top of this problem. So I'm not surprised of what Elon Musk is doing and all of that, given that in the 2000s, he actually tried to do this. Now it took another 23 years to come to the point where he can try this uh, again. 
but to to this point i believe payments is extremely interesting and exciting and then perhaps much more exotic uh, we'll probably see uh, different variations of games um, of course games whether it's direct games web3 games or communities designing some type of games through DAOs or through NFTs or just creating different layers that almost have financial games on top of them. So these are a few of the applications that we're super excited about. Of course, um, I, I could name um, a lot of the um, uh, projects that, that are built and uh, I, I've actually named a few, um, but uh, I, I believe that during the next period, while there, there will be many applications, this too will be super interesting and probably another one that will have to do with uh, just cryptographic proofs embedded in media um, or in every media file that we have um, that will go back to the point of um, blockchains being truth machines for the world. Got that. So there's quite a lot of interesting things going on on the developer side uh, at Multiverse X. That's great to hear. If we quickly speak about the user side of things, as you are building for mass adoption, I'd be very interested in hearing what kind of user activity you're currently seeing. And is it still mainly like crypto native type of users? Or have you been already at this stage able to see that uh, people outside of crypto are finding? Yeah, so we we definitely have been in the spaces where we've built the communities especially Europe focus and then probably some Asian communities and a bit in the US, we've seen some very different type of communities or demographics interact with Multiverse X. At, at, at some point, Multiverse X was called Elrond. And so a lot of the people discovered Elrond and then rediscovered Multiverse X. But we've discovered at first that a lot of the people that joined the community were at their first contact with crypto when they interacted with crypto, which was fascinating. It was interesting. It also taught us a lot of lessons around different problems. Like when I state that something like an on-ramp is extraordinarily important, I cannot overstate this enough. So when we essentially explained this to a user and then went with them through an initial process of setting up a wallet, before we had the mobile wallet, mobile experience, it was extraordinarily painful to explain all of this, to guide them through, to then make sure that they understand they should not share this with anyone, to just go through those through those steps. Now, those steps, they, they were extremely painful, but they also guided us toward a solution that leapfrogs this type of problem and then solves it and address it such that simple users can start to interact with these technologies. I, I would say that part of the adoption is driven by the cycles, natural cycles that we see. So there are the cycles where people are extraordinarily excited to the point where they're euphoric. Everyone wants to jump in, they want to play with the stuff and, and so forth. And it's extraordinarily important to have the tools when those cycles come to be able to position yourself to enable the experiences and applications and so forth. And there are more difficult times where users are not excited. And at that point, it's even more a reinforcement on building, on getting the applications ready, on getting the services ready such that not only gaming applications are ready, but then also potentially payments are ready. Because as soon as there is an application that can bridge the gap and deliver something to the simple user that is much better or significantly different than anything that they could get without this type of blockchain experience, at that point, the, the conversation changes completely. Yeah, 100%. And I think the data point that for many users, it's their first time interacting with a crypto product. That's a great one for you internally to see, especially as you're building products that aim to abstract the complexity and let people kind of unwrap into the space without having to get confused with what we're used to seeing in crypto. Now, you've emphasized the importance of community and everything going on within your ecosystem, which is great because from the outside looking in, it seems that you have a very active and thriving ecosystem built around Multiverse X. Now, I think one very cool initiative that you have started 
to kind of cater to that demand and build that community even further are both the X-Day Hackathon and the X-Day Conference. Could you briefly speak about what the purpose of those events is and what they are? Sure. The key point of X-Day is to essentially create the premier platform in Europe to have the most fascinating and exciting conversations around technologies that at the intersection of blockchain, AI, and the metaverse. Why these three technologies? Well, precisely because of the point that I was making before, we do believe that during the next decades, this will be the recurring conversations we'll have. And the breakthroughs that are happening within each of these fields make the conversation absolutely fascinating. But then they also raise a lot of interesting points, right? And this is the second goal that we have with X-Day specifically, building bridges with the real world. So it's not enough for us to have our own communities and then stick to those and so forth. If we want the space to grow to the point where it becomes the default within the economy, the default within the web space where it's not Web3, it's just the web. And this is how the web works. And all these points are integrated. Well, we need to engage with the different players, the different decision makers that have a say in all of these conversations. And so for X Day, for instance, we have three ministers of countries being present at X Day, um, engaging in some of these um, ideas and, and conversations, sharing their ideas and insights. We have the top technology companies in the world, uh, again, being present, sharing some ideas, engaging, um, announcing some things that are especially relevant for this type of conversation. Then we have people from the payment space, people from the metaverse space, people from the AI space, a lot of builders that are pushing the boundaries and sharing the ideas and demonstrating some products and all of that. And this entire point should be almost like a checkpoint where we essentially break through the initial space that we had and come to a point where this brings a much more potent and exciting influence on the world around us that is positive. Now, to that, there's also the X-Day Hackathon. And so with the X-Day um, event, we have a kind of more conversation and demonstration of products around these topics that are super exciting. But at the same time, what we want to do is create the best excuse for the top builders to jump in and just start building the products. Why? Well, because we really believe that the next Amazon and Google are perhaps just one smart contract away. So building this will take many, many iterations. Um, it will take many builders pushing through. It won't be easy. Uh, and um, of course, this uh, initial phase is never easy, but um, it definitely filters for builders that um, believe in what they want to build and then push through the different challenges in order to find a solution more than anything. So this is live. The hackathon is there. More than $1 million in prizes and, and funding. A lot of really top partners that we have. Um, more than 500 builders that are already in, registered and are building in the process. And this hackathon will also happen a bit different in the sense that people have one month to jump in to build their stuff and at X day, they have another 24 hours to build stuff there on site, meet all the other builders, and then go through the process of presenting this, having a kind of demo day and uh, being selected as one of the top builders that have pushed the, pushed the boundaries. So super excited both about X day as an event, as an interaction and engagement with different fields of the world, and then especially about the hackathon that brings together the idea that builders are the one that are moving mountains and essentially reshape the world. Definitely. And that was quite a quote right there. I, I loved it that the next Amazon or Google can be only just one smart contract away. I'm going to keep that in my mind. Definitely going <laughs> to reference you at some point. Maybe you want to jump in the hackathon directly. Yeah, yeah, I think I definitely should. Now, having this year's event hosted at the Palace of Parliament in Bucharest is actually just really speaks to the fact that you are 
concretely bridging the gap between the builders and the decision makers. So I think that is a great approach and going to be really interesting to see how that plays out. Feels like is it is it fair to say that you're kind of lobbying on behalf of crypto for the whole industry with with this event as well? Yeah, so I I do believe that it's precisely as I was mentioning before, a lot of the interactions are just let's say among ecosystem people inside the crypto space and all of that and very little of the interaction is focused and productively done in a way where it's not a fight that you need necessarily need to fight. So we see the US being super, let's say, turned onto making everything a, a war. Like, let's take this down. It's super bad, which is super surprising because the US was the, the distillation of innovation, sort of. And this is what you would have expected from, from the US. And then at the same time, um, there is this theme that we've coined around X-Day where we, we intentionally call this the renaissance of European ambition, where there's a space for Europe to really take the flag and push the boundaries and have the relevant conversations on blockchain, on AI, on the metaverse, and not sit on the sideline while the innovation moves somewhere else. And so we, we definitely are, are pushing for Europe to do that. But in the meantime, in Romania, we're having, again, the highest level conversations possible that we've built years to be able to have. So to have them and change this conversation in a productive and positive way is definitely changing the, the, the way crypto and blockchain space is seen and then opens up many bridges and many doors for all the other builders to have a much more positive and productive conversation. And we very much look forward to, to this hopefully being taken extremely serious in Europe and for Europe to see this as an opportunity and to seize it. That, that is amazing. And I'm going to add links to the show notes for everything related to the X-Day Hackathon and the conference as well for any listeners who want to dive into any more details and, and read more there. But let's move on to speak about your economic model and financials. I think that's always a very interesting topic as there are so many different approaches within the space. And because your approach in general is so unique, I also want to get an understanding of how you're approaching this side of things. So starting from the very basics, could you walk me through Multiverse X's economic model? So who are the stakeholders involved and how does value flow through the protocol? Sure. Uh, so the, the key point with a protocol is to understand that there are validators that essentially secure the network. And then there are developers that essentially build the applications on top of the network. And then there are users who just use the network, pay some fees for the services and, and all of that. And I do believe that in Multiverse X, we've designed a very unique and I believe fundamentally super effective model where the entire incentivization structure is first financed by the network through this idea of financing the validators and all of that. And then it is designed such that at every point in time, if the adoption grows sufficiently high, inflation or incentives stop completely. So there's a trade-off there where there's a plan for incentives such that the network moves forward, validators are there, the network remains secure, but there's also an intentional plan for adoption where the more fees are being paid, the better the validators are paid, and the better the validators are paid, the clearer it is is that they should not be subsidized by the network anymore, but rather they should earn the fees that are being paid within the network. So this is very different in most of the other protocols. It's just a inflation that's incentivizing the network security, and this is how it moves forward. This is what differentiates the eGold model. And the eGold um, currency is also this very compressed and simple idea, if you think about it. Um, that we've had um, books and then we had ebooks. We've had mail and then we had email. We've had gold. Now we have e gold. So that's all that the users should know when they start to engage and, and play with the technology and so forth. Now, I would say that everything depends on the adoption 
because the structure is built to accrue value on all the places, whether it's validators being very well paid if adoption happens, whether it's built in royalty fees for smart contract developers that again ensures a, a very different type of model that you have in any applications that you built on top of Multiverse X that shares a royalty with you when someone uses your smart contract on application or whether it's different other mechanisms when an application is being built, when it, it has a, a different type of token and, and all of that. So I would differentiate the different applications, the way they are, um, let's say, funded, the, the models for that, and the um, idea of the network being not only secure, but super well designed such that the security is incentivized. And then when adoption reaches a critical mass, this can enable everyone to have a bigger part of the bigger pie that has been created. Definitely. Uh, I think that's a well framed. Now, what does economic sustainability mean to you? Economic sustainability in the um, context of a blockchain, I believe, has to do with adoption, has to do with the different metrics that you're looking at, and then has to do with what's happening within the context both before adoption happens and after adoption happens. Because the adoption should just be the catalyst that makes things even more exciting and even more interesting for all the different parties. So at this point, this is precisely why we've designed the model in a way that gradually entails a halving event each year. So the eagled economics model has a sort of halving event around end of July each year where um, the inflation decreases specifically and then adoption will take at every point in time. Suppose that today we have 100,000 transactions that are being processed. All the fees subtract in real time out of the inflation a certain percentage such that the model becomes scarcer. Uh, the, the currency becomes scarcer with each passing day and there's a built-in model that transition from the subsidized network incentives to the adoption incentives that can um, catalyze the entire interaction. Got that. And when we speak about uh, kind of measuring that adoption, in your opinion, what, what are the best metrics to measure and value a blockchain? I think there there's a lot of noise usually here. There's a lot of um, conversations on different uh, vanity metrics that sometimes fit, sometimes just give you a very short-sighted view of uh, what you want to um, look at. On the other hand, I, I believe there are a few things that guide you in a certain direction, like um, daily active users. And th this you can scale on monthly active, yearly active, see how the trajectory is the important point, not the current element. Then, of course, transactions, number of wallets are just a function of the active users. And there you can see activity and, and all of that. Then fees being paid as a function of transactions and then smart contracts being deployed, um, tokens being deployed, application interaction, just um, generally, those um, are good guides as to what is happening, but you want to zoom out and you, to look at the trajectory of each of those, not the necessarily current moment where you are, where you might extrapolate something. Um, at the same time, I, I do believe that we are at the point where before a tipping point, a lot of these metrics are there, you're building the tools, you're preparing everything, but there is this tipping point that once achieved will make everything feel very, very different. And so this is what we're building with the different applications. This is why we're encouraging these interactions even with the hackathon and so forth, because we do believe that the next Amazon and Google are one smart contract away. And this essentially means not necessarily only different applications, but the scale catching up are growing much more significantly over a lot shorter periods of time. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Now, the market's been a bit tough for everyone <laughs> for quite a while now, but 
If we think of everything happening outside of just the general challenges with the bear market, what would you say are the biggest both drivers and challenges related to your growth right now? There are two, two types of growth, the user growth and the developer growth. Developer growth is oh, we've essentially built the tools, put them in place, and now we've started the engines. Uh, the hackathon is the best moment to jump in the water, test the tools, and accelerate this kind of cycle, iteration cycle that we're having. So we are extraordinarily excited about that and also very curious to draw some lessons and conclusions. What are the things that you developers really love? What are the pain points? How large are the applications? What are the challenges with them building this type of applications? And that's one direction where I believe that it's just about moving forward with the tools, getting exposure and making things a lot simpler to be built on this front. So the faster you can iterate, the faster you can go from an idea to the real implementation to decide, is this good? Is this bad? Is this useful? Do I need to really change it? The faster we can reach a point where the tools are essentially being used, start to be used everywhere where they where they really fit. And then at the same time, there's the user growth, where I believe um, it's all about one application or a, an accumulation of utility that is granted to users in a way where everyone finds it natural to have such an application, where, whether we discuss about Exportal as an app, as soon as you can use, for instance, stable coins at native speeds to make any kind of payments that you really need. And you have all the other cool things, the non-custodial nature of Element, the, the other dApps and so forth, gamification and all of that. At that point, it probably creates a forcing function in adoption because you, you have to flip this and think it through the lens of the user. The user is generally lazy. Like, no one wants to change something. If it works, like, I won't change it until I'm super forced or until it's super exciting and, and I really want this thing. Otherwise, I won't change it. And so then you understand why something that is being shared needs to be usually at least 10 times better. Once it crosses that threshold, it becomes so natural that you're starting to wonder, why has this not happened before? Like, it's precisely like the conversation that we've been having with the on-chain 2FA or with the state sharding architecture. Once it's solved, it will seem like everything was just a smooth upward momentum. But essentially, it's um, never like that. You're pushing super hard for years and then one moment clicks and unlocks this type of usage that can um, essentially accelerate things uh, very, very significantly. Yeah, slowly then suddenly, and that, that's how it goes. That's indeed. Yeah, this has been uh, an incredible overview of uh, Multiverse and I think the general kind of potential of crypto because I love the way I speak about it in terms of unlocking the mass adoption and that, that's what the space needs. Just to wrap this session up, I, I'd want to hear a bit about the most exciting things coming from your mid to long term kind of product roadmap. We know that on the roadmap, one big exciting thing is the X Day conference, X Day hackathon. But if we think about the product, is there anything you can share that listeners should be looking out for? Yes. So definitely all the cool things uh, or part of the cool things will all be shared at X Day and uh, we'll share a lot of updates on stage on all the things, but then also the ecosystem will share many, many exciting things that are happening. What I'm particularly excited about at this point is one, bringing everyone together at X Day and uh, sort of facilitating or accelerating a kind of tipping point. So just because everyone is there and all the interactions are happening, accelerating and, and all the conversations are happening in the same space, sort of, this is really important. Second, the hackathon, extraordinarily important and very curious to, to see what's being built. And then on the protocol side, as I was mentioning before, ideally by end of the year, we'll have several 
important milestones uh, achieved. One that is happening right now that has been presented is there's the first on-chain governance protocol vote that is happening for a release right as we speak. The details have been presented and all of that. And with the community, we're moving forward. There's a very, very significant release, the serious release that is currently bringing a lot of interesting new things that are improvement um, in terms of consensus and all of that VM upgrades, so virtual machines and tooling, uh, very, very significant upgrades on that front. The, the protocol governance I was mentioning, and we have an Agora forum that is up and now users are preparing for this vote. And then a lot of conversations around light clients and all of that. This is just one release. There are several releases already planned, discussed, being implemented. Next release is focused on um, staking phase four, so an auction model for the staking model for validators that is happening on top of the network. Other improvements or um, releases that come with sovereign chains, so parallel shards that enable you customize architectures for any type of solution that you have that you can deploy in a smart and focused way with token, without token, just you customizing your stuff to be able to leverage the blockchain at scale. On top of that, of course, zero knowledge technology applied on top of the Multiverse X blockchain and about that we'll very soon have some conversations. We've mentioned a long time ago that we've been looking at what the smartest way are to, to actually tie this and, and further accelerate or scale some of the things. This is all on the protocol side. Of course, a lot of the updates on the tooling side that um, are now out and being stress tested by the developers and hackers in the hackathon. So very curious to see how that evolves. And then on the product side, there are several products that we're super excited about. Um, but um, suffice it to say that having all this technology embedded in an interface that makes it invisible, just gives you names, uh, hero tags, which are this name services, identity, all of that. And you can interact with it, not only in the digital world well, with full, uh, let's say bulletproof security, but then also in the real world via card, through payments and, and all of that, that puts the entire blockchain conversation in a very, very different space. And this is why we're super excited, both about X-Day and the next period ahead. That is fascinating. So much going on. I love to hear that. And I can't wait to see all these new updates roll out and everything that's coming from your side. Thank you so much, Benjamin, for this incredible overview of Multiverse X and also the pain points related to crypto and how you're approaching uh, enabling mass adoption for the whole space. Very important stuff. I hope we can uh, do this again at some point to see where you are in, say, six months time or something like that. Thank you. Yeah, very much looking forward and very much looking forward to, to pushing the pedal and accelerating on some of these efforts as much as possible.